This video will cover the five crucial components of understanding heart function. By the end of this video, you will have gained a strong foundation in several key principles governing the function of the heart. Number 1. The electrical current in the heart flows from cell to cell. The heart's electrical current originates in a group of cells in the right atrium, known as the sinoatrial node, SA. These cells are also known as pacemaker cells. The electrical current travels through the heart from the sinoatrial node through the atria downward to the atrioventricular node, AV. The electrical current then travels down the atrioventricular septum and, lastly, up the walls of the ventricles through the Purkinje fibers. This smooth flow of electrical current through the heart is possible due to membrane proteins known as gap junctions. Contractile cells of the heart, known as myocytes, are linked together by gap junctions that have an opening so the contents of the cytoplasm of one cell can travel to the neighboring cell. As a result, an action potential, or electrical current, is able to be spread from one cell to the neighboring cell through the gap junctions. When the sinoatrial node sends out an electrical stimulus causing an action potential in the cells surrounding the sinoatrial node, the action potential is then able to travel to the neighboring cells until the action potential has passed through all the contractile cells of the heart. This allows for a smooth flow of electrical current from the top down in the atria and from the bottom up in the ventricles. Additionally, since action potentials can spread through the contractile cells of the heart, there is no need for a neuron or any signaling from the nervous system to provide the electrical signaling to each individual myocyte to cause contraction. Number 2. Contraction in the heart follows the principle of excitation-contraction coupling. When a muscle cell is electrically excited by an action potential, contraction of the myocytes follows immediately. This relationship between electrical excitation and muscle contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. Therefore, when a contractile cell in the heart receives an action potential, it contracts. By knowing the direction electrical current flows through the heart, it is possible to know the direction of muscle contraction in the heart. Since electrical signaling begins in the right atrium and spreads from the top of the atria down, this means contraction of the heart begins in the atria and that atrial contraction occurs from the top down, thus sending blood to the ventricles. The arrangement of electrical flow in the heart allows for electrical current in contractile cells of the ventricles to flow from the bottom of the ventricles to the top of the ventricles. This arrangement of electrical flow means contraction of the ventricles starts at the bottom of the ventricles and works up, sending blood flow out of the ventricles to either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. The direction of electrical signaling and subsequent contraction allows for maximizing blood flow through the heart. Blood is pumped from the atria into ventricles, and blood in the ventricles is then pushed upon from the bottom up. If contraction had originated in the ventricles, the ventricles would contract before they had finished filling with blood. The right atrium receives blood from the veins in the body, the inferior and superior vena cava, and the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins. If the atria contracted from the bottom up, or if the ventricles were to contract from the top down, blood flow would be reversed and life would not be possible. The electrical flow of the heart allows enough time for blood flow to fill the ventricles before they contract, and that optimizes the volume of blood in each ventricle before each contraction. Number 3. Cardiac output is the rate at which the heart pumps out blood per minute. The volume that the heart pumps blood into the circulation is known as cardiac output and is dependent on the heart rate and the volume of blood circulated in each heartbeat. The left ventricle provides the cardiac output for the systemic circuit. The amount of blood that leaves a ventricle in one beat is known as stroke volume. Stroke volume is measured in units of milliliters per beat, ml slash beat. In order to calculate how much blood is pumped out of the ventricle per minute, stroke volume must be multiplied by the number of contractions that occur per minute. The number of times the heart contracts in one minute is known as heart rate, HR, and is measured in units of beats per minute, BPM. Therefore, cardiac output can be calculated by multiplying stroke volume by heart rate and is represented by the formula 
cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. The milliliters measured for the stroke volume are converted to liters, making the units for cardiac output in liters per minute. For a healthy adult, a resting cardiac output is approximately 5 liters per minute. For example, if a person's resting heart rate is 70 beats per minute and stroke volume is 75 milliliters per beat, cardiac output is 5.3 liters per minute. The cardiac output increases when the demand for blood flow increases. During aerobic exercise, cardiac output can increase to 25 liters per minute or even higher. Once exercise has ended and the demand for blood flow decreases, cardiac output will also decrease. Cardiac output changes as the need for blood throughout the body changes. An increase in demand for blood leads to an increase in cardiac output, and a decrease in a need for blood leads to a decrease in cardiac output. The amount of blood circulated by the heart per minute is a direct reflection of the need for blood at that time. Number 4. Ejection fraction is a measure of the efficiency of the heart. The amount of blood available for the heart to pump is the end diastolic volume. The end diastolic volume is the volume of blood that filled the heart when the heart was in diastole, the resting state of the heart. Stroke volume is the volume of the end diastolic volume that was pumped out of the heart. Ejection fraction can be represented by the formula ejection fraction equals stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. The resulting decimal is multiplied by 100 and ejection fraction is measured as a percentage. For a healthy individual, ejection fraction often ranges between 65% and 80%. Ejection fraction is a fraction of the end diastolic volume, meaning it is the fraction of blood that was ejected during contraction of the heart. If end diastolic volume remains the same and stroke volume increases, ejection fraction increases. The benefit of an increased ejection fraction is to increase the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart in one beat. The greater the percentage of end diastolic volume that is ejected during the contraction phase of the heart, which is known as systole, then the greater the efficiency of the heart will be. To understand this concept, remember that cardiac output is dependent on the amount of circulating blood per minute. To meet this demand for blood flow, both stroke volume and heart rate contribute to ensuring cardiac output. If stroke volume is decreased, the amount of blood ejected from the heart per beat is decreased. In order to maintain cardiac output, more beats will be needed in one minute to circulate the same amount of blood. As a result of stroke volume decreasing, heart rate must increase to maintain cardiac output. However, this also means if stroke volume is increased, the amount of blood ejected by the heart increases. This would mean fewer heartbeats were needed to circulate the same amount of blood per minute. With fewer heartbeats needed, the heart becomes more efficient as less contractile work is necessary per minute to circulate blood. Ejection fraction never reaches 100%. However, there is evidence that a healthier heart has a higher ejection fraction. Furthermore, a common problem in heart failure is a reduction in ejection fraction. The reduction in ejection fraction can become so severe that blood flow is inadequate for day-to-day -day activities such as walking or showering. With heart failure, ejection fraction can become so low, death results. Cardiologists rely on ejection fraction as a fundamental means of measuring the health of the heart. Number 5. Stroke volume can be increased. When a person goes from rest to exercise, there is an increase in demand for blood flow. Initially, there is an increase in heart rate, and many blood vessels vasodilate to allow for increased blood flow to the tissues. This will lead to an increase in blood entering the heart, which is known as venous return. However, if there is an increase in venous return, then there is an increasing need for space within the ventricles for this blood. As a result, the ventricles stretch to accommodate the increased volume of blood they are receiving. This stretching of the ventricles means the cardiac myocytes are also stretched, which means that they contract with an increased force. This increase in the force of contraction due to the cardiac muscle being stretched is known as the Frank-Starling mechanism. 
The Frank Starling mechanism states that an increase in stretching of cardiac muscle results in an increase in force generated by the muscle. The significance of the Frank Starling mechanism is that the increase in the force of contraction leads to an increase in stroke volume. Therefore, stretching the heart, as occurs with increases in venous return, results in a larger stroke volume than had the heart not been stretched. For example, a person at rest has a stroke volume of 75 milliliters per beat and an end diastolic volume of 110 milliliters. This results in an ejection fraction of 68%. However, during exercise, as the heart is being stretched by increases in venous return, end diastolic volume increases to 130 milliliters and stroke volume increases to 100 milliliters. This results in an ejection fraction of 77%, a 9% increase in ejection fraction from rest. Thus, due to the Frank Starling mechanism, not only does stroke volume increase because end diastolic volume increases, but the percentage of end diastolic volume that is ejected per beat increases. Stroke volume can also be increased by signaling from the sympathetic nervous system to the heart, which increases the contractility of the heart. This increase in contractility is independent of the stretch of the heart and is the result of intracellular signaling molecules induced by the sympathetic nervous system. The ability of the heart to increase stroke volume greatly enhances the ability of the heart to meet demands for blood and oxygen as the body's demands for blood flow change. Thanks for watching our video on the heart, and remember to subscribe to our channel to see the latest videos on the science of human physiology.